I'm unclean, I'm unrighteous, I'm dried out, and I'm unstable. You say, well, why in all the world would Almighty God listen to a guy or a woman who's unclean, unrighteous, dried out, and unstable? Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. And Colin, I'm going to put you on the spot here. How do you answer that question? Why would God answer the prayer of such a person? But there's only one word answer, and that's grace. That's the only explanation. But the reason for that fourfold description of absolute desperation is that that is precisely how Isaiah the prophet describes our own condition when we're praying. This is very important. When I pray, I'm not heard because of some righteousness or something that I've done that uh, is going to be found in me. When we come before the Lord, we come empty-handed, come as those who are beggars seeking bread. We come looking for his mercy and for his grace. It's wonderfully liberating to understand that. How many people have thought, I can't come to God until I've sorted myself out enough to be able to come? Well, if you go on that basis, you'll never come to God. You'll never pray. You'll never become a Christian. We have to come as we are. And it's really good news that however desperate and however weak, God is ready to hear us and receive us when we truly come to him. That's a terrific truth for us to hang on to as we open our Bible today at Isaiah 63 to 4 as we continue the message, Restore Prayer. Here's Colin. Now think about this. Many Christians are persuaded in their minds that God can resurrect them from the dead and bring them into everlasting heaven after they've died but they're not convinced that God is able to give them victory over what they call a besetting sin while they're still alive. Think about that. We talk about our besetting sins, our pride, our laziness, our indiscipline, our lust, our greed. What happens is that because we know so little of the power of God in our lives, we find a way of accommodating to live with our sins. We say, that's just the way I am. I can't change, at least in this area, and therefore we quickly lose hope. When Isaiah says, oh, Lord, come down, come down and make your name known, come like the fire that sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, he is saying, Lord, come in a way that causes us to experience your power in our lives. And again, you find in the New Testament that this is precisely how Paul prayed for ordinary Christians like us in Ephesus. Ephesians and chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20 there. Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he's called you and so that you will know the incomparably great power of God for us who believe. Because the power of God for us who believe, Paul says, is like the mighty power he exercised when he raised Jesus from the dead and caused him to ascend into heaven. Now, Isaiah knows from his own experience that the vast majority of court believing people have no sense of that power of God being at work in their lives, which is why they're always complaining about being so weak and incapable of victory. So, I'm wanting to stretch your vision to pray bigger prayers. I'm wanting to ask you that alongside praying for your family and praying for your friends and all the details of personal life that are absolutely appropriate to bring before God, I wanted to ask you to pray with me for a movement of God in our lives and among our people and through our ministry that would cause His felt presence to change our lives and to change the lives of other people as well. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you would make your name known. Oh, that you would be among us in a way that's like fire that causes twigs to blaze and causes water to boil. Oh, that you'd be here in a way that changes lives. I'm asking if you would pray that with me yourself. I'm asking you to pray that in your family, to get a bigger horizon of what we can ask from such a great king. It's great to pray for all the folks who are in hospital. Let's do that. But let's do more than that. 
Let's learn to pray at another level from Isaiah the prophet who cried out to God, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Make your name and your nature known. What to pray. Now, here's the second thing. I said there would just be two parts here. The second, we talked about what we should pray. I want in the second part to look briefly at how we should pray. I want to be really practical here because there are some wonderful things to learn from the model prayer that Isaiah has here for us. And I I can summarize uh, the point uh, perhaps best this way, that effective prayer rises from confidence in the goodness of God and confidence in the relationship that we have with God. In other words, if you're going to pray like Isaiah prayed, it will come from these things. It will flow from them. You've got to know and grasp and see the goodness of God, and you've got to know and grasp and see the relationship that by God's grace, through Jesus Christ, is yours with Him. How to pray here you are. You're, you're sitting sometime next week, and you're saying, I, I, I want to spend some time in prayer. How do I get started? Where do I get going? Well, I want to suggest that you begin by filling your mind with the goodness of God. In fact, that's one of the reasons why reading the Bible is such a helpful way of getting us moving in this whole business of prayer. Because in order to pray effectively on any given day, I have to fill my mind with a fresh sense and knowledge of the abundant goodness of God. And I want you to notice how Isaiah does this. It's very striking. If you look at the context of Isaiah 64, you will see it clearly. It's almost like watching an athlete, you know, in the long jump, and there's this long run-up, and uh, you you see this athlete, and he's gathering pace as he goes along the run-up, and then finally hits the board, and then he's off, and he's airborne as he takes into the air. Well, look at the run-up to this great prayer in chapter 64. It begins as far back as chapter 63 in verse 7. And the run-up is all about Isaiah filling his mind with the goodness of God. Verse 7 of chapter 63, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds of which, for which He is to be praised, according to all that the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things He has done for the house of Israel, according to His compassion and His many kindnesses. And he goes on to list all the works for which God is to be praised. Now, here's the interesting thing. Isaiah is not actually praying at this point. He's not speaking to God. He doesn't begin speaking to God until the middle of verse 14. Suddenly, in the middle of verse 14, he starts speaking you language, and his eyes are up towards the Lord. He says, this is how you guided your people to make for yourself a glorious name. But he takes off in verse 14. His run-up is in verses 7 to 13. What's he doing in these verses? He's preparing his mind to pray. And you prepare to pray by filling your mind with the goodness of the Lord. Effective prayer arises from seeing how good God is. Faith, we learned this a few weeks ago, is the conviction that God is always up to something good. And so, if you want to pray with faith, you must begin by filling your mind with the great truths of the gospel, that this God to whom you're coming is the God who loves you, This God of whom I'm going to ask great things has already sent His Son into the world for me. And so, if if He would send His Son into the world for me, then why would He withhold from me any good thing? This God knew me before I was ever born into the world and planned in love for every moment of my life and my eternity, and it's to Him that I'm coming. Now, you fill your mind with the goodness of God, you will find that things begin to move and you have a greater liberty as you launch yourself into prayer. It's almost as if chapter 64 bursts out of Isaiah's mind being 
filled with this catalog of the goodness of God. Anyone who comes to God, anyone who seeks Him, the book of Hebrews says, chapter 11 and verse 6, must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. You're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith and the message today, Restore Prayer. It's from a series, Restore My Soul, Heart Cries for Revival. Looking at that big question today, how should we pray? And if you've missed any of the series up to date and you want to go back or listen again, you can do that online at our website, that's openthebible.org.uk. Or as a podcast, simply go to your favourite podcast site and search for Open the Bible UK. Back to the message now, here's Colin. Fill your mind with the goodness of God, that will launch you into prayer. And then here's the second thing. The how of prayer plead the relationship that you have with God. And this is very important. Let me tell you straight up, and this is from my own experience, but it is honestly universal Christian experience. When you pray, if you begin praying this year in a serious way, you will very quickly feel your unworthiness. And that's precisely where people get discouraged and quit and give up and don't come back. I want you to know that if you feel your unworthiness when you pray, we all do. Coming into a holy place makes you aware that you are an unholy person. And Isaiah felt the same way. You see it in verse 6 of chapter 64. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteousness, he's including himself here, all our righteous acts, rather, are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. It's very quickly, four pictures of our human condition. Isaiah says, here's what we're like when we come before God. When I come before God, I come as a leper, as one who is unclean, as someone who in and of myself, I have no right to enter the presence of God. That's the first picture. Second picture is rags. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. In other words, the best things that we do, like preaching, serving, worship leading, the best things we do are never as good as they appear because our own hearts are so mixed up in so many ways. All our righteousness is like filthy rags. Augustine said, I dare not, he said to God, I dare not commend to you the work of my hands because if I did, you'd probably see more sins in them than merit. The best things I do, are mixed with that which is unworthy. So Isaiah is aware of this. Then he uses a third picture, like the leaf. We all shrivel up like a leaf. Boy, that's so helpful. I think it means this. Isaiah felt worn out when he came to God, exhausted. I'm like a dry leaf. I lack energy. I lack life. I don't feel I've got anything to give in prayer. And then the fourth image is like the wind. Like the wind, our sins sweep us away. What a picture that is of the power of sin. Here we are struggling with the same sins we struggled with before. And we are not prevailing against the world, but the world is prevailing against us. So Isaiah comes to God and he he feels this fourfold unworthiness. He says, oh God, I I come to you, and this is what I feel. This is the reality that I see. I'm unclean, I'm unrighteous, I'm dried out, and I'm unstable. You say, well, why in all the world would Almighty God listen to a guy or a woman who's unclean, unrighteous, dried out, and unstable? Why in all the world would God listen to you or to me. And that's why I'm saying when you come into the presence of God, 
You not only fill your mind with the goodness of God, but you plead your relationship with God in and through Jesus Christ. I just want you to see how Isaiah does this in these moments. Verse 8, he pleads the relationship he has with God as Father. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. That supremely is the relationship that we have with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, you see what he's saying? Lord, I come to you. I come to you as an unclean, unrighteous, dried out, unstable person. And yet, I'm asking you to hear me today. And here's the reason. Because you are my Father. In Jesus Christ, you have adopted me to be your son and your daughter. For his sake, listen to my prayer. Don't let guilt kill your prayer life. The only sinless prayers that were ever made were the prayers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all other prayers hang on the mercy of God. We plead the relationship that we have with God in Jesus Christ. I come to him and I say, the reason I'm asking you to listen to my prayer is simply that in Jesus' name you are, O God, my Father. You come to him like that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will never turn you away. He will hear your prayer. And here's the very last thing. I want you to notice that there's a second marvelous description that Isaiah has of our relationship with God, and the two must always be kept together. He describes his relationship with God not only as our Father, but as the potter. Verse 8, we are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Now, when Isaiah, entering the presence of God, says, you're the potter, he is inviting God to make whatever God chooses of Isaiah's life. He's coming to God and he's saying, here I am. Now, you're not only my Father, by grace through the Lord Jesus Christ, but because I am His and therefore I am yours, my life is surrendered for you to do in this life, with this life, and through this life, whatever you choose. You're the potter. I am the clay. We begin as a church praying like this. What it means is we're saying, Lord, this is your church. And as best we know how, with all our hopes and dreams, we want to be wholly available to you to do whatever is your purpose, whatever you desire to do through us here and around the world, because you are not only the gracious Savior, you are our sovereign Lord. In other words, prayer that seeks the presence of God recognizes that Prayer's not about you trying to bend God to your desires. It's not you and me trying to get hold of God to get what we want done. It is in the last analysis, us coming before this gracious Father who is also our sovereign Lord and saying to Him, Lord, you are the one who must shape and mold my life and make of this life Not what I think it should be, but what you plan for it to be. You start praying like that, you'll be a different person a year from now. We start praying like that. Lord, this is your church, and you are to shape us. We ask and mold us and make us whatever you want us to be here and around the world. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down? That's a different church. Boy, this is very simple. 
but it is earth-shakingly profound. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, O God, and come down. Oh, that you would come down among us in such a way that lives are changed by a felt knowledge of your love and an experience of your power. And, oh God, we come to you filling our minds with your awesome goodness in the gospel. We come to you recognizing our own unworthiness, but we are pleading the relationship you've formed with us yourself. You're our Father in Jesus Christ, and you are the potter. And our greatest desire is that you would make of this life and make of this church what you will. I guess I've just got two questions. One is, are you ready to pray Isaiah's prayer? The second is, do you think you're ready for Isaiah's prayer to be answered? Of course, it was answered. Wonderfully answered when God's people came back from exile. Wonderfully answered at a much greater level when God rent the heavens and came down in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are living in anticipation of the day when its ultimate fulfillment will be complete. And the trumpet will sound, and he will rend the heavens, and he will come down, and every eye will behold him. And on that day, may it be that we are ready, prepared to rise and to meet him with joy, seeing face to face the one we have loved, worshipped, and known heart to heart. Two powerful questions today as we end our message. Are you ready to pray Isaiah's prayer? And are you ready for Isaiah's prayer to be answered? Our message has been Restore Prayer, and it's part of a series called Restore My Soul, looking at nine heart cries for revival. And if you've missed any of the series or you'd like to go back and listen again, you can always do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk, or find us as a podcast, follow the link on our website to find the podcast, or go to your favourite podcast site, search for Open the Bible UK, and subscribe to receive regular updates. We want to help you to understand how the books in the Bible fit together. And a good way to do that is with Open the Bible Story. You can find that on our website. It's a journey through the whole Bible, a study course in 30 parts entitled The Drive. It will take you deep into the valleys of the Old Testament, the peaks of the glories of Jesus and the ups and downs of the Christian life. All the way through, it will show how the Bible always points to the person of Jesus Christ. You can find Open the Bible Story on our website, that's openthebible.org.uk. Open the Bible is supported by our listeners, and this month, if you've been considering setting up a new payment in support of Open the Bible, we have a great offer for you. To say thank you, we'll send you a copy of C.H. Spurgeon's book, Encouragement for the Depressed. Colin, how will C.H. Spurgeon's book help those who feel discouraged today? Well, Spurgeon is really a very tender shepherd. He, he was a pastor, and he spoke with great strength, but also with great gentleness that arose really out of his own experience of suffering, and especially what he sometimes referred to as the black dog. There was a darkness that sometimes came over him, and it was a real struggle in his life. I mean, he says, for example, the strong are not always vigorous, the wise are not always ready, the brave are not always courageous, and the joyous are not always happy. So this is a realistic view of the Christian life. He's speaking into the realities that we all experience, and he's speaking out of his own personal experience. And what he brings is a wonderful encouragement to lay our burdens on the Lord and to trust his promises even in the darkest times. Well, we'd love to send you a copy of this book to say thank you for supporting Open the Bible financially. 
This offer is available all this month if you are able to set up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible in the amount of £5 per month or more. Full details or to give online, come to our website, openthebible.org.uk. For Open the Bible and Pastor Colin Smith, I'm David Peck, and I hope you'll join us again next time. Millions of people aren't really interested in God. So what do you think God would say to them? Find out next time on Open the Bible.